Hello everybody and welcome to this CBT Nuggets webinar titled Building a CCNA Home Lab with the one and only Jeremy Chara. Uh, a quick note for everyone, the chat pod is available to you to ask any questions you have and Jeremy will do his best to get to them at the end of the webinar. Uh, I'd also like to remind you to check out our blog, blog.cbtnuggets.com for the webinar recording that will be posted later this week. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and pass it off to Jeremy. Awesome. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, and welcome to the hundreds of people that have joined the conference. It's good to, uh, good to talk to you. I love doing these uh, live webinars because there's just so much well, – it's, it's my chance to interact with people. Usually I, I'm talking to myself, so it's, uh, it's good to have live people there. So uh, as Anthony said, uh, this webinar will be open for questions throughout the entire uh, time. Um, I, I actually keep the, the little chat window open, so as you're typing them, I actually see them scrolling by, uh, which, is, uh, which is fun. Now, with the hundreds of people, obviously I can't talk, read, and comment on all of them at the same time, but what I try to do is hit as many of them as I can. Uh, so the fun part about this webinar is I have my questions that I'm going to ask and answer uh, on some pre-prepared slides, but really my, my goal is to make maybe 15 minutes of content and advice from my side, and then just answer all of your questions, or as many of them as I can possibly get to in the time that we have allotted, uh, to just to make, because I know a lot of you, you don't have the opportunity to uh, interact with me regularly, well, now's, now's your chance. So uh, this is the topic of building a CCNA home lab, and I'd like to broaden that topic into uh, building a lab in general and, and uh, setting up Cisco gear sitting at home. Uh, back, I got, I got uh, my, well, I, I started into the Cisco world as we went in from 1999 to 2000. And the first thing that I ended up doing was building a little lab, and then it kind of grew into something grand by the time I was studying for my CCIE, where I invested tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, in lab equipment because it was so expensive back then. And I am, oh my goodness, you, you guys are alive at such a good time because uh, equipment is so much cheaper than it used to be uh, with, the, with the Cisco, especially with the, the evolution of 100 megabits to gigabit per second. It has left this whole gamut of gear out there that nobody wants because it's 100 megabits per second, which is phenomenal for a lab. Uh, but because gigabit is the thing, you know, everybody's buying gigabit. So anyway. I'm already off the beaten path. Let me take you to my first question because I know a lot of people are wondering this. I'm talking about lab. I'm talking about real equipment sitting in front of you that you can smell, taste, <laughs> if you really want to, touch it. Um, so people say, well, what about GNS3 or Cisco Viral or the Boson simulators or the – I mean, essentially there's a whole gamut of other equipment that you can end up using for a home lab as you're studying for your certification. Why on earth would you pay when you can get a lot of these things for free to build a home lab? This is probably the, uh, the biggest question that I will, will passionately answer because it's not real. So here's the deal. You can do all kinds of amazing stuff in GNS3, and I, and I full-heartedly recommend GNS3 for the bulk of your studies. However, when it comes to getting into the Cisco world, especially, I mean, this, this webinar is all about building a CCNA home lab. Uh, so it's somebody just getting into it. There's, there's a, a gap between uh, actually learning the content and dealing with the equipment. I mean, I've, I've actually seen it. I've, I've gone with CCNA on network jobs, and I'm like, hey, can you just punch those cables down and, and make sure that runs over there? And I've seen them go, what are you talking about? You know, it's like, you know, if you haven't actually seen it, done it, used it, there's just something, and it's almost like the very soul of what you're doing is missed. So the very first thing that I always recommend is to get some real gear because it actually helps you put together the pieces. Now, you may be able to pass the exam without a home lab. You may be able to pass, you know, learn commands, type them into GNS3, make things work in a formulaic kind of way. But, but when it comes to actually getting the very soul and heart of networking, you actually need to see it work and see it with real equipment and see it happen. And so, so that's why I really uh, emphasize investing in a home lab. Now, I see uh, Bharat asking a question. It says, what is the first thing you do when creating a lab? Do you build some extravagant networks, or do you go with the checklist of the exam? 
Actually, Brat, let me uh, – you, you, it's, it's almost like you staged that question. Here's, here's my next question. What do I do to get started in my home lab? Do I build this extravagant network? Do I go with the equipment from the uh, lab requirements? And I would honestly say none of the above. Here's what you do to start your home lab. You go and you buy a really cheap router. And I, I went and grabbed, when I was preparing the slides for this presentation, I grabbed uh, three of the models that I would recommend that just because they're so cheap. Just right off eBay, I grabbed the current prices. You can see I've got 2611 or 2621, and there's the XM version, which is actually the, the better one. But I also, when, when I put this list together, I mean, I've, I've had people, they're like, oh, I've got a 2901. It works great. You should sh suggest it to everybody. I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. But a 2901 is probably 800 bucks. And people getting into Cisco uh, can't afford 800 bucks sometimes. And so that's why I'm like, look, if, if, if you can't throw – you know, 50 bucks on the table to invest in your education. Um, I'd, I'd be really concerned with, with your commitment to it. So this is just the minimum to get started. Why do I recommend this? Um, because this allows you to convert your house to a Cisco-based network. And just by putting a single router, and you can see I've got the uh, 20, 2621 uh, sitting up there. The reason I like that 2600 series is it's really cheap, and it gives you the ability to uh, put serial modules in. Um, but having this single router allows you to learn so much in a real-world fashion for your house. When I, when I first did this, now I, I actually got into Cisco before I got married. Um, I had Ethernet cables draping through the the hallways, I had IT phones sitting around the house. I mean, it was just, it was crazy, because like, it's my house. I can mess it up. Now, when I, get, when I got married, things had to change slightly. Um, <laughs> and when I took down the networks, I, I found out that uh, maintenance windows and things like that were, uh, were key to my happy marriage. Uh, but at the same time, this allows you to learn things like network address translation, access control list. Uh, you can set up routing protocols. You can set up uh, static routing. You can, I mean, I'm just, these are things I'm, I'm pouring off the top of my head. Base configurations, security, SSH, Telnet. I mean, there's so much stuff that you can do with a single router, and it's making your actual house work through this device. This one device, so for 50 bucks or less, and I would say if you're a savvy shopper, you can get some of these devices for 10 bucks. You can do it. Now, um, the reason I put the other ones, you can see the Cisco uh, 1721 and the 871, is because you quickly will find out that real Cisco gear, <laughs> not that this, uh, none of this stuff is you know, not real, but essentially the stuff that they use for uh, business grade enterprise networks, uh, like that 2600 series, have fans. And I realize a lot of you like me work in your office all the time, and after a little while hearing that, especially if it's old and you buy it on eBay and it's like, <laughs> you start going crazy. So getting those little, those little uh, small routers uh, are, are awesome because they uh, sometimes are fanless, sometimes have a, have a fan that uh, you can't even hear at all. So, so they're designed for you know, the ultimate small network. Now, I see Christopher asking the question. He's like, hey, would you uh, set this up in a mini rack or would you do it in a closet or basement? Um, good question. I would act, I mean, <laughs> right now I'm talking about a single router. Obviously, you don't need a rack. Just kind of chuck it in the, in the corner. But when you start putting together more gear, I would suggest having some kind of system for it uh, rather than just creating a pile. Because if it becomes a mess, it just becomes discouraging to work with. It's almost like you demotivate yourself to even look at it because it's so, uh, so messy. So uh, other thing that uh, I, I want to mention while I'm looking at this, you can see the 1721 has a WIC 1 Enet on there. That's a module so you can get the second Ethernet port. Essentially, all of these devices that you see on the screen right here are uh, for um, – <laughs> Reading questions make me, makes me lose my train of thought. Um, all of these are for uh, routing a DSL or cable connection um, coming in there. Okay. Uh, second thing, so question, question number no, question three. So a lot of uh, – I'm seeing all the questions pouring in. Um, so one, let me just grab one more of these questions coming through. Uh, someone saying, would, would you suggest creating a uh, network diagram for this? Um, Yes, I would. I would actually create a diagram of what you have or could have connected 
uh, when you do this. Um, also, I, going back to that, would you put it in a rack? Would, it, would you put it in your basement? You put it kind of anywhere you have available. Um, I live in Arizona in a single story uh, house where I don't have a basement or a separate location. So literally all my equipment lives in my office, which means in the summertime when I kick it all on, it gets hot. <laughs> I'm like, this is the price. You know, sometimes I'll move my laptop and go work out on the couch uh, while I'm studying just because it gets, I mean, I, I could tell you stories of just sweating in my office while I'm, I'm studying. So uh, requirements for iOS 15, and let me talk iOS in general. So uh, iOS 15 has been out for a few years from Cisco, and all the uh, certification exams are all like, oh, iOS 15, you should have knowledge of iOS 15, all that kind of stuff. No, no, no. You don't. So iOS 15 is the iOS where Cisco started going with licensing keys uh, and that kind of thing, which makes it a lot more difficult to use those in a lab environment because obviously the licensing uh, for the iOS from Cisco is uh, quite expensive. Now, the licensing for the iOS from Cisco, obviously this is not gear that we're using in business networks. And, and just so you know, it is illegal to take the stuff that you find on eBay and buy it and go use it in a business network. Now, if you take that thing and use it offline uh, for study purposes and things like that, now, <laughs> I'm not a Cisco licensing expert by any means, but from what I have read in the licensing documentation, Cisco's like, totally fine, go for it. It's not in a production network use. So coming back to the iOS 15, iOS 15 has a lot more stringent licensing requirements which could be tested on, but functionality-wise, at least, to this day, uh, it doesn't have any like groundbreaking features like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you don't have iOS 15. You should have that uh, in order to learn these kind of things. It's it's just you know kind of mod anyway. Not to get into iOS 15, you do not need iOS 15 in order to study. Um, did I click to this slide? How did that happen? Start. I must have clicked to this slide. <laughs> my 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 uh, my mind is already advancing. So what switch should you use to start your home lab? So. Uh, you can see the switches that I have up there. These are all 100 megabits per second switches, and that's what I was saying at the very beginning of this uh, webinar, is it is a good time to be alive because uh, with gigabit now taking form everywhere, where everybody's like, why would you buy anything slower than gigabit for production network? And they're right. That is a good question. You have all of these amazing switches that used to cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Like at 3750 I actually just bought one off of eBay. Uh, I have it sitting right next to me. I'm like, oh, I love it. Because this thing used to be thousands of dollars. And now for a PoE, I mean power over Ethernet, 100 megabit per second, layer 3 switch, it's like 106 bucks. I mean, which I know 106 bucks is not something to, to just be like, oh, whatever. But at the same time, compared to what those things – anyway, it's, it's crazy how cheap these things are. So 2950 I would say, is the bare minimum. The reason uh, I would suggest that is because it is the cheapest, and that's about it. You can do VLANs on it. You can do trunking. Uh, the vast majority of Layer 2 switching commands uh, you can do off of that device. Uh, but if you have a couple more bucks, and I literally mean a couple, I would suggest using the 3550 or the 3750 switch. Um, the reason being is those are layer 3 switches. Okay, not a CCNA topic, right? There actually is no layer 3 switching, at least uh, beyond the initial concept of it, in CCNA. But at the same time, you can uh, use those switches to move into the CCNT, and man, I'm telling you, if you're using those at, at your house, the possibilities are endless. I mean, set up every single room of your house as its own VLAN. Uh, set up a public Wi-Fi for your neighborhood and isolate it into a VLAN and use Layer 3 switching with, with access control list to isolate that public Wi-Fi from the rest of your network so people can't steal your stuff uh, when you're <laughs> making this public Wi-Fi available. I mean, oh my goodness, there's so much you can do with a Layer 3 switch. And, and again, I'm... I'm I'm, I am a passionate geek by nature, right? I just do this kind of stuff. I love it. Um, but, but keep in mind, when you're talking about your house, and I know I'm talking about your setting up your home, what's the difference between your house and your company? Pretty much the price of the Internet connection. There's probably more people there. And instead of bedrooms, they have cubicle walls, right, and conference room walls. I mean, essentially, you can create the same kind of thing in your house. You can set up servers. And I, I would... I would encourage you, set up servers, run VMware ESX, another free one that you can download, uh, and set up virtual machines for your different servers that you want to run inside of your house. Separate those things into different VLANs using one of these kind of switches. Set up layer 3 switching. Uh, so 
anyway, uh, this is, uh, this is the, the, the core switch. I would suggest if you can only afford one, if you can only afford one of each device, I would grab, I would grab the 20, yeah, 2621 because and that's the difference, by the way, between the 2611 and the 2621. 2621, uh, uh, did, I, did I answer that question? 2621 is 100 megabits per second. Um, grab that one and then grab a 3750. Now, what, what's the difference between the 3550 and the 3750? Uh, 3550 uh, is usually uh, proprietary. The Cisco, so, so Cisco came out with power over Ethernet before there was an industry standard. I think they called it inline power. Um, so most of the 3550s, if not all of them, only support the Cisco proprietary power over Ethernet, whereas the 3750 does the industry standard 802.3AF, the, the normal PoE, for, so you can power, you know, heathen brand wireless access points or, you know, whatever, whatever else you want to power with those things. That's the big thing. Um, also, you can do, I believe, private VLANs on uh, 3750. You can't do those on 3550. So did I answer my question? I would suggest getting one. <laughs> Now you, see, now you understand what I do when I'm recording. I pause and I'm like, what did I just say? And I go back and I go, wait, no, I've got to fill that in. can't do that live. Um, so, so I would suggest a 2621XM. And I would suggest a 3750 as like bare minimum, just getting started. Okay, now what? What about the CCNA? What's the ideal lab setup? Well, I actually went, when I uh, asked myself that question, I didn't think, you know, well, you need two routers, five switches, you know, nine crossover cables. I, I didn't think that. I just thought, okay, what would I expect and what does Cisco expect somebody going after the CCNA to be able to do? And then I drew up a topology that would allow you to accomplish just about every objective that they have in the CCNA exam. And then I said, okay, what's the ideal lab setup? There it is. Three routers, three switches, and a couple laptops just so you can have some host devices to plug into your network um, to, to test the thing out. And that's, that's one of the things I can think back to when uh, I was first getting started in Cisco. I got so into the Cisco side, I forgot about the hosts and servers. It's, it's kind of like I got into this network world that I was so excited to build that I built it, and I was like, oh, yeah, I guess people have to use this, and, and I actually should test this thing out. So having the uh, laptops there are awesome to be able to do your testing, you know, ping between devices, make sure your routing is working correctly, and all that. And uh, I know I'm looking, seeing a question from Christian saying, if you plan on going beyond the CCNA, uh, would you suggest going a different route than what, what I'm showing here to future-proof your equipment? Uh, honestly, no. I mean, when you get into the CCNP, you will do the same stuff. I mean, and, and here's, here's the fun part. Here's the fun part about networking. I know we're all like, latest and greatest, like, you know, I've got the iPhone 6 Plus, you know, I've got the iWatch or whatever, you know, it's coming, I, of course I use all Apple stuff, or, or the Android, you know, whatever, we're all latest and greatest. But did you realize when we're dealing with networking, I mean, we're dealing with protocols that are 30 and 40 years old. There's, I mean, think about that. I just uh, finished recording, what did I record? Uh, something on BGP, and I just went back to refresh my memory. I was like, okay, when did BGP come out? like the current version, it's like 1982. So, so going back to Christian's question, you know, do we need more recent equipment to really future-proof ourselves? I mean, think about it. The 2621 was created way after 1982. You know what I mean? Um, so, so no, you, I mean, as you move into the CCNP and even the CCIE, uh, you can use the same gear again and again and again, which is, which is awesome. Now, you may run into things. Now, okay, here's a big thing I want to make sure I mention to you. Um, you may run into a topic here or there that you just can't do without buying equipment. Like back, back when I was uh, studying for my CCIE, I had 3550 switches, and I paid 1200 bucks. Can you believe that? 1200 this, this makes me sad in a way. Um, I look at that 3550, and I'm like, yeah, that's about 20 bucks. I paid 1200 bucks for my 3550 switches back in 2000 four-ish, um, and I found out I couldn't do private VLANs on those things. And I'm like, oh, man, I can't do it. And so I started thinking, okay, do I need to buy, you know, better equipment to really, you know, type in private VLANs? And I'm like, no. You know, when it, when it comes down to it, like, for instance, uh, one of the things I hear a lot about is IPv6. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I need to practice IPv6. And I'm like, yeah, totally. That is um, a, a uh, key thing to, to know. But at the same time, if you're – 
like, hey, I'm going to drop, you know, 800 bucks to get equipment that does IPv6 or, or that does iOS 15 or whatever the case is, and really consider that cost. So, you know, because I've done it. I've bought the equipment. I get it in there, and I type in, like, three commands. And I'm like, well, that, that was it. I, I guess I feel better now that I typed those commands in and I saw that the, the prompt took them. Um, so you, you know what I mean, right? Really see what value you're going to, uh, to do. So another question from Torx. Forgive me if I pronounce uh, names wrong. Uh, saying, can I use the CCNA for my future CCNP certification? Yeah. I, I would say this topology that you're seeing right here, maybe add a couple routers to it. A couple routers probably don't need any more switches. Um, to that topology, and you've got your CCNA lab topology as well. So, um, and that would be a fun thing to do is if anybody's interested, I could also create a CCNP topology. But I mean, really, it's just a couple more routers. So, okay, last question that I had, uh, and then I just want to take all of your questions that I see uh, coming in in flurries. Um, anything else I need? Um, so I would suggest grabbing a bunch of Ethernet cables. Now you can, <laughs> I, I have Ethernet cables that like breed like rabbits in my house. Every time I buy something new, they give me this little cheapo Ethernet cable I throw in a, a box somewhere. So I have a ton of them, but I don't know why there's something just gut level that makes me feel better when they're all the same color, they're all the same length. Come on, who's, who's coming with me? You guys know what I'm talking about? They're all the same whatever. And, and so I always go to a website, I, I think uh, China funds this thing, uh, monoprice.com. I don't know how the prices are so cheap otherwise. Monoprice.com. Um, and they have Ethernet cables for like a buck a piece. I mean, brand new. I've rarely had any of them that are, are bad or anything like that. So I get all my Ethernet cables from that. Great, great site. Um, over on the right-hand side, you can see serial WIC 1T and WIC 2T. That's a, that's a big thing to know. Um, so there are two serial standards, and when you're thinking about serial ports, think about practicing TCP, frame relay, HDLC. I mean, all of the WAN link kind of stuff falls into that. There are two kinds of serial ports. There's the DB60, that's the the one on the upper left there, and then there's the smart serial connectors. Uh, Cisco's big claim to fame, like, oh, it's amazing, was to create a little WIC card that had two serial ports, and the way that they did it was to change the interface they used to that really skinny connector. Um, I'm all cool with that, and that, that is a, a great connector, but I have found that the cables and the connections and everything is more expensive if you go that way. So if, if getting some great connections uh, uh, cheap is your route, then I would go with the upper one, the DB60. Uh, if you are not really caring about how cool it looks and all that, uh, or wait a sec, no, I, I just retraded my thing around. If you're more concerned with how cool it looks um, and that you can get more serial connections, then go with the smart serial connectors. Then you've got to buy the crossover serial cables that you can see right below that uh, for the kind of interface that you buy. And of course, don't forget your console cable, which it comes with most Cisco gear. Even if you buy it off eBay, they'll just chuck them in there because everybody has 100,000 of those things. And then uh, your USB to serial adapter because uh, laptops nowadays don't come with Serial ports. Um, I saw one of, one of the things I want to. Uh, I saw a couple of these questions going through about access servers. Uh, do you need an access server for your lab? Now, um, quick description for those of you that don't know uh, what an access server is. So, an access server is the ability to actually uh, access the console port of all of your equipment from one device. So you can you can tell that into uh, one router that'll be your access server and then kind of daisy chain that through um, oh what do they call it but it's a uh, octal cable uh, an octal cable octal cable is that right o yeah uh, to where uh, the the uh, access server then connects to all the different equipment that you have in your rack um, I will say if you move on beyond your CCNA yes I suggest getting an access server because uh, at least for me it was on the other side of my desk so every time I had to change console ports. I either had to reach over and spill my coffee to do it, or I had to walk around and, and do that. It just, I mean, well, I guess, are you, are you really wanting to sit all day, or do you want to stand up and walk around would be the question. But, um, yes, if you seriously want to get into a lot of equipment, CCNP, CCIE, you do want to get an access server. Uh, I think that's all I got. I don't know. Hang on. What time is it? It is, oh, man, I went longer than I thought I did. But I answered some questions going through. So, so. Uh, uh, Charles is saying, can you spell octal cable? It's octal like um, octo octopus, uh, O-C-T-A-L, octal cable. Um, so the reason they call it that, it's, uh, 
is it Okta or Okta? Now I don't know. Um, but essentially, it gives you eight connections uh, out of a single cable. It looks really cool. It is one of the cooler cables that uh, I have. Milton has it. Octal, that's exactly right. Octal cable. Um, so Sanjay is saying, what access server would you recommend? Honestly, um, it was a, I had one, and it worked great and still would work great to this day. Um, it is a 25, oh, come on, everybody, help me out here. It's like a 25. 11 or something like that. It's like an old, like, you know, pull the drawstring on the side, so it's a lawnmower kind of router. Um, but it works awesome. Um, and it had two, uh, 2511, thank you, James, Milton, you got it. 2511, uh, Kareem saying 25, I think it's the 11, because I think that has the um, Ethernet port. Although, man, if I'm thinking back to that, that guy, that was back when they had the thin net and thick net Ethernet. There's a history lesson for you. Uh, so you may have to get the little, um, uh, phalange, uh, what is that thing called? You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, where, where it d adapts the uh, thin net to the um, uh, the Ethernet standard of today, and it's um, uh, just a couple bucks for that. Uh, okay, so let me hit some of the other questions that are coming in. Would it be overkill to create a website behind your home lab to host it? Uh, can you do some real world stuff? That I'd do it, <laughs> sure. Uh, I'm not a web web developer, but if you've got some web skills. Do it. I mean, set up a little website at your house. Like one of the things I did, um, not really web hosting, but uh, behind my, my little Cisco firewall at my house, I set up all kinds of different remote desktop ports. Now, this is back when you know, Windows XP ruled the world and all that. So, so me, my wife, everybody uh, that had a computer in my house, <laughs> which was me and my wife and my other five computers I had for no good reason, could remote desktop in and I'd actually use NAT uh, in different port numbers to, to connect to whatever computer I wanted to from the outside. So yeah, host things from your house. Go, go to town, Lewis. Uh, would you recommend the same setup for ICMD1 test, or is this more geared for the 200-101 exam? Um, I would recommend that same setup for the ICMD1. So going back to uh, the question, this is from Joey. Uh, this one right here. Um, I would suggest that for ICMD1 only because Cisco has really upped the ante in uh, 2015, 2014, 2015, as they revised these exams, I think one's a pretty beastly exam these days. So I would uh, I would suggest that one. Uh, another question: I have a CCNA, but need to review for a job interview. What would you recommend to review and recommended sites? Oh, oh, I didn't I, I didn't realize I had one more question. And you need a mission. Thank you. Uh, actually, Luis, you you uh, gave me my my question right here. Um, so. This goes back to the uh, beginning of when I started building a lab. I, I found that I got addicted, if I, if I can use that word loosely, to shopping on eBay for finding cheap Cisco gear. And I would actually collect it and pile it up. But when it actually came to the point where I had to do something with it, I didn't know what to do. And I see that many uh, more people than just me that do that. They, they kind of get on, on a, a hype. They're like, oh, you know, I can build this amazing Cisco lab, and they do, and they spend a couple hundred bucks, and then they look at this stack of gear, and they're like, now what do I do with it? And, and so you need a mission, and how do you get a mission? Well, that's why I started this whole webinar with the recommendation of, hang on, let me just find the slide, with the recommendation of starting with just one router and just one switch. Because at that point, you can set up your home network, uh, and that's your mission. I mean, set up your home network, secure your home network, set up VLANs between your bedrooms, set up secure Wi-Fi in your network, you know, da, 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 you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as you go down. Um, that could be your mission. But once you go beyond that, if you're going to build a topology that looks like this, you've got to have a mission. And that, your mission could be you know, going through uh, the CPT nuggets that I created, that Keith uh, created for some of the labs that, that uh, correspond to the CCNA, and actually doing the, the lab that um, that they yeah, that we do, you know, go through the same thing, try things that we don't do in the videos, or go outside of that. If you can break it, and uh, and restarting that uh, that whole thing, um, uh, as you say, re <laughs> someone someone skyped me and they said restarting a server. I'm like restarting. Uh, so see if you can break it. See if you can uh, uh, mess it up and then fix it all over again. Or you can go buy a lab book. I know there's all kinds of uh, labs that are out there, like Cisco Press created a book called CCNA Lab. You might check, or wait, no, it's called CCNA Practical Studies. You might check that one out because that gives you a bunch of labs. So again, with just buying equipment without a mission, it's just going to sit there. So 
ask me questions. That's the slide I thought I was on. <laughs> so, um, so please ask me questions. What other questions do you have? Let me let me just scroll back through the tons of questions that are here. Um, so I'm looking from the bottom up. So Brian, you win. It's a where do you deploy a TFTP server? Is it on one of the laptops in the in the uh, question three slide? Um, so going back to this, where would you set up a TFTP server? Uh, you could do it on one of the laptops. Just download the TFTP D32 um, TFTP program and set it up on there. Uh, you could you could actually use one of your routers as a TFTP server. That would work just fine. Uh, you could set up a little server of yourself. Like I I went and found a little Acer box. I mean. Again, equipment has become so cheap. It's like 200 bucks off of Amazon for a little box uh, from Acer that I could use to run ESX. And I, I actually spun up a little Windows XP or Windows 2003, I mean essentially some long since disbranded uh, version of Microsoft that I ran a TFTP server on. But I know some of you are Linux whiz as well. Feel free to you know, spin up a free Ubuntu instance, all that kind of stuff. Uh, let's see, Alan. Alan, is there any licensing fees associated? <coughs> Moving on from Alan's question. I don't know. Uh, I've, honestly, I from what I've read in Cisco licensing documentation for the iOS, it just says do not use used equipment in production use. So I'm assuming behind the behind the scenes, Cisco is like, okay, well, if you're using it for training or learning purposes, you don't have to have a valid uh, license. Uh, <laughs> scrolling through these questions, I'm getting partial questions or things that people are asking. Uh, let's see, TSTP show, uh, set up a very big. Uh, should you set up a static IP address for your home lab? Uh, so I'm assuming, uh, Nick, when you're asking that question, you're talking about the outside world, so having a static ISP address or something like that uh, for your home lab. Yeah, I would, I would do that. Or if that gets too expensive, because I know some ISPs totally rake you over. Um, like if you, you ask, um, I, I'm not going to throw any of ours under the bus, but if you ask them for a static address, they're like, well, you want our business connection, and that will be $130 more a month, which is just goofy. But anyway, uh, you can use dynamic DNS. Uh, a lot of the, you can just install a little client on one of your computers that gives you a dynamic DNS um, name. So you might just Google dynamic DNS if you want to do that. Uh, I, think, I think that's the bulk of the questions that I have. Um, oh, Matthew, great question. Matthew is asking, is viral uh, worth the investment over GNS, GNS3? Um, maybe. So Cisco, we're talking about viral, Cisco viral, uh, virtual, uh, we've got a CBT Nuggets uh, series on it actually. Anthony Sequera put that together um, where he talks about uh, this, this, essentially Cisco is like, okay, everybody's using GNS3, um, which is kind of against our licensing, but, but uh, we need to come out with a, a version of it. So they actually released a kind of a uh, public flavor of IOU, iOS on Unix. Uh, which has been their kind of behind the scenes project for a long, long time. Um, so that's what viral is. And I would say viral is great from a scenario perspective, meaning GNS3, when you get it, it doesn't have any scenarios. Now, there are all kinds of websites you can go to, like GNS3 Labs, I think it is, um, and others that I can't think of right now. But there's a lot of them where you can get scenarios for GNS3. But again, I've seen, uh, and I myself have wasted a lot of time in GNS3 trying to come up with a scenario. And unless you, essentially you have to have somebody that pushes you out of your box, you know, it's out of your comfort zone and gives you something that you can't figure out. Building your own scenarios are valuable, but they only go so far before you're like, okay, uh, I don't think I can stump myself anymore. You know what I mean? So, so a lot of times having viral or somebody create a scenario for you that you can't solve uh, is is totally valuable. So that's that's what I think um, uh, viral would be great for. Uh, so Jonas is saying once you have the necessary. Oh, Henry is saying no, you didn't answer my questions. Uh, type them again, Henry. I missed them. There's a lot of them. Uh, once you have the necessary equipment, uh, the mission should be to do all the labs and CBT nuggets, for example, for CCMP voice. Uh, yeah. I, well, I would say that would be a great starting point. Is essentially do what you see me do in a lot of the CBT nuggets. Uh, as you know, almost repetition. Do it for yourself and kind of own it. Um, but uh, but um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm reading as I'm talking. But uh, going beyond that, I mean, again, going into the forums, uh, hitting GNS3 Labs, seeing if other people have scenarios for you to do, would be would be great as well. 
Uh, we're getting cut off. At, I, I just got the notification that we're getting cut off in five minutes. So let me. I'm going to get as many of these as I can. I'm going to be as, as concise as, as I possibly can. Can we rent Cisco Lab for an exam? Yes, but the problem with renting, again, goes back to the whole premise of building a lab yourself. Uh, when you rent, you essentially lose the ability to have it there for yourself, to actually plug cables and see how things are connected, which is critical for CCNA. So yes, you can definitely rent. Uh, iOS version for the 2511 router, Ooh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I can't even remember. That, I think I used like an old 11.2 version for the 2511, and it worked fine. Because when you're talking 2511, you're talking old school, and all you're using it for is an access server. So essentially, if you can get the thing to boot, that's a successful iOS. Um, Tom is saying, I purchased an 1841 router and an XM, so some, some equipment. Am I good to go with these? Yeah, looking at the equipment list, I would say, yeah, that will definitely do you for the CCNA lab, uh, Tom. Gary, I have been given some equipment and list the equipment. Is this okay for lab setup? Yeah, so, so essentially, again, let me, let me just go back to this. That's what I would suggest. So any combination of gear that you can get that achieves that, um, for a CCNA study, totally, I would, I would go for it. Um, Roger saying, is it recommended to buy switches on Amazon instead of eBay? I have found some great stuff on Amazon because they allow you to do it, but it's usually more expensive than eBay, but usually a little more guaranteed than eBay. So it's a risk reward kind of thing. If, if you're okay with the risk of eBay, you can probably get it cheaper than you can off of Amazon. Uh, Milton saying, I have a block of five static addresses. Don't know what to do with. Don't know what to do with a block of static addresses. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. I'm like, I don't know. What could you do with it? So, so you could. I mean, you could set up an email server. I mean, okay. There's there's a fun project for you. Uh, move your email server and host it locally out of your house. If you've got a block of, of five static IP addresses, set up a Ubuntu uh, server instance with um, oh, what is like a um, there's. I'm, I'm definitely not an Ubuntu uh, whiz, but I can hold my own. And there's all kinds of free mail servers. So set up a, a mail server, set up a website. Mail, uh, so you've got five static addresses. You probably don't need them. But um, I would say you could get by with one. Uh, can you provide any advice for configuring my 871 uh, ADSL broadband UK-based? No. Um, how do I extract the I'm sorry, I'm not in the UK. Uh, and know their, their specifics, but um, outside of the DSL portion, I'm sure all the commands are the same. How do I extract the iOS from real switches or real routers for lab purposes, Henry asks. Uh, and that would be using TFTP, uh, setting up TFTP and uh, copying the iOS off of there. Uh, Henry's also asking, CCIE, in these aspects seem far away. Would you have any advice for me to fully grasp networking to the CCIE level to meet these requirements? If not, what would you advise me to pursue? That's a big question, Henry. Um, I would say that I mean one. Yeah, I would say that's probably outside of the scope of what I can talk about in short order. Uh, what would it take to get to CCIE? Uh, there's a whole presentation behind that. Uh, what is the difference? Okay, last two minutes, last few questions. Uh, what is the difference between one router and one laptop? And what is the use of that? I guess there would be more of the command. Okay, so so Matisse is asking. Uh, why, would I, why would I set up a system with just one router, one, one laptop? Well, again, with one router, you can do all kinds of stuff with the Internet connection. I mean, you've got one laptop. I mean, get that laptop to surf the Internet through the router. Just to do that, you have to understand static routing. You have to understand NAT. You have to understand access control list, base configurations of the device, enable secret, telnet password. I mean, there's so much stuff that you can learn with just one router. Uh, is there a way to simulate a VPN connection from a home lab? Uh, I wouldn't. I'm sure there is with uh, GNS3 simulated, um, but it wouldn't be easy. Uh, any recommendation for renting labs? No, uh, I don't have any recommendations for those. those I've, I've actually used uh, INE, Internet Work Expert, to rent some stuff. They seem to be pretty good. Uh, routers are cheap. I heard, uh, wait a second, I'm like five pages back on my questions. Hang on. What was the name of the lab book, Steve? <laughs> I'm scrolling down to the bottom. Steve, it was a CCNA Practical Study from Cisco Prep. It was a pretty good one for practicing Cisco CCNA scenarios. Uh, and now I'm, I'm uh, back into the questions I've already answered, I think. Okay, last, okay I'll take this, this one last, and then Anthony, I'm going to hand it back to you. 
Uh, Charles is saying, be careful. Most home ISP providers will block SMTP port 25. That's absolutely the case because uh, people will set up little spam bots out of their house and spam the world or get infected with a spam uh, critter that will spam the world. So most ISPs do block port 25 so that they can save the reputation of their IP addresses, which prevents you from, uh, from running at least easily a uh, home lab server. So that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> I got a lot more, but, but I'm hitting the, hitting the wall on time. So let me, in that case, say thank you a ton, a ton, a ton. Uh, I love doing these presentations. Um, and I will pass it back over to Anthony. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, thank you to everyone out there. We had some great questions. Uh, I'd like to remind you all to stay tuned and check out blog.cbtnuggets.com because we'll be posting the recording there. Um, but overall, thank you to everyone who made this possible, and thanks again, Jeremy. That was great. No problem. See you all later.